In the last video, we defined the max flow problem and derived the ford fulkerson algorithm to solve it. At the end of the video, I hinted that proving the correctness of ford fulkerson depended on cuts in the graph. In this video, I want to define the min cut problem, use ford fulkerson to help us solve it, and then prove the max flow min cut theorem, which will imply the correctness of our algorithms for both problems. To begin with, I'd like to briefly review our Ford Fulkerson pseudocode for solving max flow. We're given a directed graph with edge capacities, and we're trying to figure out how much flow can we push from the source to the sink. In this pseudocode and throughout today's video, we will assume that the source vertex has no incoming edges, the sink vertex has no outgoing edges, and there are no pairs of vertices in the graph that have edges in both directions. It's important to note that none of these assumptions are essential. You can modify our algorithms and our proofs to handle all of those cases, but they'll help us simplify the presentation by focusing in on the most important aspects. Our algorithm works by building a residual graph and then repeatedly finding augmenting paths, that is, paths from the source to the sink in the residual graph that use only positive weight edges, and then each time we will push flow equal to the minimum weight of any edge in the path. When we push flow, that increases the flow on any forward edges we use, and decreases the flow on any back edges. And as we update the flow, we also update the residual graph, and then find a new augmenting path and repeat. We discussed this algorithm in much greater detail last time, so I encourage you to look back at that video if you need a refresher. In the last video, we also walked through the execution of Ford Fulkerson on a graph similar to this one, and by the end, our residual graph looked like this. And we saw that we could read off the flow from the residual graph by looking at the weights of the back edges. The total outflow of the source here is 8, which is equal to the total inflow of the sink, and part of our goal for this video is to prove that this must be an optimal solution. But to get there, we need to consider another closely related problem. In the min cut problem, we are given exactly the same inputs as for max flow. We get a directed graph with edge capacities, along with source and sink vertices S and T. But in this problem, our objective is to find a cut through the graph that separates S from T, and we want the edges that are split by this cut to have the minimum possible capacity. To formalize this, we'll define an ST cut of the graph to partition the vertices into two subsets, where one of those subsets contains S and the other contains T. And the capacity of any cut is the sum of the capacities of the edges that cross the cut. So for example, if we had a cut that put S on one side and all the remaining vertices on the other side, that cut would have a capacity of 10, whereas a cut that put T on one side and all the remaining vertices on the other would have a capacity of 9. Our goal then is to find the ST cut with the minimum possible capacity. And the residual graph that we are left with after executing Ford Fulkerson gives us a starting point for finding such a cut. Specifically, when we run Ford Fulkerson, we keep going until we have eliminated any paths from S to T. So the edges that get used up by Ford Fulkerson should separate S from T in the original graph. So one way we could get a cut of this graph is by finding the vertices that are still reachable from S and putting them on the S side of the cut and putting everything else on the T side of the cut. In this residual graph, we find 
that B, E, and D are still reachable, so our cut would put S, B, D, and E on one side and the remaining vertices on the other side. If we now want to ask what is the capacity of this cut, we need to go back to the original graph and add up the capacity of all the edges crossing the cut in the forward direction. Now we want to find all of the edges that have their source on the S side of the cut and their destination on the T side. And those are the edges I've now highlighted in red. Notice that the edges from A to D and C to D do cross the cut, but in the reverse direction. And so we don't care about their capacity when evaluating the capacity of the cut. So when we add up the capacity of all the highlighted edges, we get a total of eight, which is better than either of the cuts we considered before. So now our question is whether this is the best cut we can find. But first, let's write down the algorithm that we just used. So our algorithm is to find the things that are still reachable from S in the residual graph. And since this cut is based on the residual graph from flow F, we will call it K sub F. Now that we have our algorithms for max flow and min cut, we want to prove them both correct. And the basis for their correctness is the max flow min cut theorem. The theorem says that if we find a flow f where the residual graph has no augmenting paths, that's the same as saying that f is a max flow or that kf is a min cut. My goal for the remainder of the video is to prove to you that 1 implies 2 and 3, which is sufficient to show the correctness of our algorithms. And once we've established that, you will definitely be capable of proving the reverse implications. Our first step in reasoning about the connection between augmenting paths and cuts is to define a net flow across a cut. If we have some cut in the graph, whether it's this specific cut or any other, as long as S and T are on opposite sides, we can talk about the net flow across the cut as the total flow on edges that cross in the forward direction minus the total flow on edges that cross in the reverse direction. And a first thing to observe is that the net flow across any cut in the graph must be less than or equal to the capacity of that cut. We could prove that directly by comparing these two definitions, but I think it also helps to illustrate. So let's suppose that we have partitioned our graph so that we have S on one side of the cut and T on the other side, and then there will be some edges that cross this cut in the forward direction and some that cross it in the reverse direction. And we said that for any cut, we got the net flow by adding up all of the flows in this direction and then subtracting all of the flows in the other direction. So we're adding up all of the flows on edges that go from the S side to the T side and then subtracting off all of the flows on edges that go from the T side to the S side. But if we think back to how we defined the capacity of a cut, 
And that was the sum of all of the capacities on edges from the S side to the T side. But we know by the capacity constraint that for every edge, the flow on that edge can be no larger than its capacity. And that means that adding up all of the red edge capacities must already be at least as large as adding up all of the red edge flows. And subtracting off some of the blue edge flows can only make the net flow smaller. So we conclude that for any cut, the capacity is greater than or equal to the net flow. This immediately tells us that the flow is upper bounded by the capacity of this cut or this one, because we know that the value of the flow is equal to the outflow from S, and the net flow across this cut has to be equal to the outflow from S, and likewise the value of the flow is equal to the inflow of T, and the inflow to T is equal to the net flow across this cut. But what about other cuts in the graph? Specifically, let's think about how the net flow changes if we move a vertex from one side of a cut to the other. Let's suppose that we have a vertex V and we're considering moving it from the T side of the cut to the S side of the cut. Well, this vertex might have some in edges coming from the S side and some out edges going to the S side, and in edges and out edges connecting it to the T side, and there might be lots of other edges between the S and T sides of the cut. So let's draw in a bunch of those edges and think about which parts of the net flow are changing when we switch the side of the cut that V is on. So let's first think about the net flow across the cut if we put V on the T side of the cut. In that case, the edges between V and the rest of T aren't counting towards the net flow across the cut. So we can get the net flow across the cut by adding up the rest of the flow plus the flow from S into V minus the flow from V back to S. On the other hand, once we move V to the S side of the cut, now the edges between V and the rest of S are not contributing to the capacity of the cut, but these ones between V and T are. So our net flow across the cut will be the rest of the flow between the S and T sides, plus the flow from V to the T side, minus the flow from the rest of the T side back to V. So how do these compare? Well, we can use the conservation constraint to think about the relationship between the flows into and out of V, because all the other vertices in the graph are either in this set or this set, we can add up the flows from S into V plus the flows from the T side into V to get the total inflow of V. And likewise, we can add up these two terms to get the total outflow from V. And by the conservation constraint, we know that the total inflow and total outflow must be equal. And now, with just a bit of rearranging, we get that V's contribution to the net flow is the same in either case. And this means that moving a vertex between the S and T sides of the cut never changes the flow across the cut, 
So if we start with the cut that separates S from everything else, where we know its net flow because it's equal to the value of F, then we can move any vertices we want from the T side of the cut to the S side without changing the net flow. And that means that for a given flow function, every single ST cut has net flow equal to F's value. Now, combining these two facts, we know that the net flow across any cut is the value of the flow, and every cut has net flow less than or equal to its capacity. So, we know that the value of the flow must be less than or equal to the capacity of any cut in the graph. And if any flow in the graph has value less than or equal to any cut of the graph, that must mean that the max flow is less than or equal to the min cut. So now let's return to the idea of a residual graph with no augmenting paths. If we have a flow f where the residual graph gf has no augmenting paths, then when we identify the cut kf from that residual graph, all of the vertices that are reachable from S are on the S side of the cut, and everything else is on the T side, which means that there cannot be any edges crossing from the S side of the cut to the T side in the residual graph. Otherwise, the vertex over here would be reachable. So if we have no edges crossing the cut in the residual graph, that must mean we've used up all of the capacity of any edges that crossed the cut in the original graph, and that we don't have any flow coming into the S side along any edges that cross from T to S in the original graph, because then we would have a back edge in the residual graph that would make the vertex reachable. So we have that the flow on every edge crossing in the forward direction is equal to capacity, and the flow on every edge crossing in the reverse direction is zero. And if all of the edges crossing the cut in the forward direction have flow equal to capacity, and none of the edges coming back across the cut have any flow, then the capacity of the cut must be equal to the net flow across the cut, which is equal to the outflow from S, which is the value of F. So, if we find a flow whose residual graph has no augmenting paths, then we have found a cut whose capacity is equal to the value of the flow. And since the maximum flow must be less than or equal to the minimum cut, if we have found a flow and a cut that are equal, then we have found both the max flow and the min cut. And this tells us that the ford fulkerson algorithm correctly identifies both a max flow and a min cut.